On Tuesday, May 14th, the city of San Francisco voted to ban the use of facial recognition by government agencies and police. Similar legislation is being considered in other cities, and the news reignited debates over the use of facial recognition in our everyday lives. While it has some interesting applications, mostly for security purposes, there are also some valid concerns around possible misuse for discrimination and possible bias. But what is facial recognition, and how did we end up in this predicament? Well, I'm going to tell you in under 10 minutes. Before we get started, this is a quick reminder that next week's video is going to be a Q&A video, so get your questions in either on this Reddit thread or by using the hashtag AskEverydayAI on Twitter. Thanks! Okay, on with the video. In short, facial recognition technology is a system that's capable of identifying or verifying the identity of a person from an image or video frame. Now, there are a lot of ways of performing facial recognition, and not all of them rely on AI. Typically, these systems have access to a database full of images, and they use this database to compare an input image until they find a match. Depending on how similar the image in the database is to the input image, it might just be a matter of overlapping the input image onto the database images until you find one that lines up right. On the other hand, AI is often used when the input image is substantially different from the source image that we have in the database. Within the AI community, this is often referred to as person re-identification tasks. Now, one of the things that I want to make clear is that facial recognition only works if you're in the database. If you aren't, there isn't an image to compare you to. And that's not to say that there aren't other ways of using your picture to figure out what your identity is, but those wouldn't use facial recognition. However, the majority of people's photos, at least in the US, exist in some sort of local, state, or federal government system. Remember your passport photos or your driver's license headshot? Those images can be used in these systems. In fact, the Transportation Security Administration, or the TSA, just launched a program where airports can use facial recognition, where the database is Homeland Security set of photos of people, to identify people instead of using boarding passes. Customs and Border Control has been doing this for a while upon re-entering the US. Anytime I fly into Boston Logan, I have to go through a system that matches the current picture of my face to my passport photo. We've also seen facial recognition used to identify terrorists, such as the man who killed five people in Annapolis, Maryland last year. Interestingly, Taylor Swift uses facial recognition at her concerts to identify known stalkers. Now, this is all to say that facial recognition can be used for positive purposes. However, there are valid reasons to be concerned. And to understand those concerns, we need to take a little trip back in time to get a better understanding of the thing that makes facial recognition possible, photography. The first permanent color photograph was taken in 1861. People had been trying to take color photos since the 1840s, but doing so required really long exposure times. And once the photo came out, it faded really quickly in white light. Once people were able to take color photographs, they began experimenting with different camera settings to make the picture look as nice as possible, similar to how we use filters on our images before we post them on social media. And by the mid-1900s, there was a need for an industry standard to make sure that skin color balance was consistent across photos. Enter Shirley cards. These cards were used as a reference to make sure that color development processes produced the same results every time. If your process didn't recreate the tones on this image, you'd tweak your process until it did. It served to balance bright colors and fair skin tones. Now, while Shirley cards were useful for making people with fair skin look great on camera, they also made pretty much anyone else look not great. Japanese actors and actresses were the first people to mount concerns about this as they noticed that they didn't look as good on American television shows. By the mid-1990s, Japanese companies developed their own Shirley card with a Japanese woman. And in 1995, Kodak came out with a multiracial reference card with three women on it in the hopes of resolving this issue. However, the photography industry had already been biased towards correcting photos to highlight fairer skin tones, which is an issue that continues today. Another thing that we should briefly talk about is the types of people who were photographed over the years. While taking a picture is cheap and easy now, it hasn't always been. In the past, wealthier people were able to take photographs of themselves and their families because they could afford to, but poorer people couldn't. This resulted in a lot of pictures of people with fairer skin and not that many pictures of people with darker skin tones. 
And this issue is propagated through today, where facial recognition data sets are often imbalanced in favor of fairer skin tones. Now, what do color correction and imbalanced data sets have to do with AI? Well, it becomes a lot harder to label an image if the algorithm hasn't seen this kind of image before, or if the image is substantially different. This became a problem in IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon's facial recognition models, which all label images based on the objects that are in them. These models struggled to identify people with darker skin tones as a person because it just hadn't seen that many pictures of people with darker skin tones. Their data set was imbalanced. The images that it did see may have also been color corrected, so the algorithm hasn't seen what a real person with a darker skin tone looks like. And these issues can cause people to be misidentified as someone that they're not. And now back to today. Facial recognition is being adopted for security and surveillance by governments and law enforcement agencies around the world. Cell phones are increasingly using facial recognition instead of fingerprint scans or passcodes and airports are using facial recognition to boarding passes. Now all of this has mounted general concerns around privacy and whether or not we should be able to be anonymous citizens, but there are also a lot of concerns that are specific to underrepresented minorities, undocumented immigrants, and religious minorities. The idea of a surveillance state has been long unpopular with the US citizen, and facial recognition takes a step in that direction. Misidentification of a person could lead to them being arrested for a crime they didn't commit, and based on these data imbalances, it seems like it'd be more likely to happen to an underrepresented minority, someone with darker skin tones. Similarly, people attending protests might be tracked by the government. In fact, China is currently using facial recognition to track ethnic minorities in what they claim is an attempt to thwart terrorist attacks. So this definitely won't be the last time that we talk about facial recognition on this channel. This is a technology that I really expect us to continue to have to wrestle with. As with most AI, I think that it has the potential to be used for really positive applications but that we're going to have to be very careful and mindful of making sure that it's fair for everyone and making sure that it is not misused against certain groups. On the upside, we've seen a lot of the people who are worried about how it might affect them stand up and say something. The ACLU is currently advocating for cities to limit the use of facial recognition technology until we can really verify that these things are safe. So I guess we'll see what happens. If you like this video and you want to see more videos like this, you can let me know by subscribing to my channel and smashing that like button. You can also support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of my current patrons. Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.